Okay, well, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, um, Dr. Ben Wilder, who's going to be talking to us about cactus studded coasts and reconnecting to the Gulf of California. Uh, Dr. Wilder, um, whose research focuses on desert ecology and botany, is the director of the Desert Laboratory on Tumamak Hill and one of the founders of NGEN, uh, that is Next Gen Sonoran Desert Researchers. Um, I am incredibly grateful to uh, count Ben as one of my collaborators. Um, and Ben uh, has just brought an incredible new vitality to research in and on the Sonoran Desert. Um, and not just in the physical sciences, but uh, I would say across um, all the, you know, the entire spec uh, spectrum of research. And one of the things that I really uh, appreciate, about, uh, appreciate about Ben is, is the way that he uh, is constant, constantly looking for new kind of uh, interdisciplinary ways that um, help us come together around research on the Sonoran Desert. So Ben, um, really great to have you here today um, and uh, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Excited to be part of this series and to be doing it with you um, and Carlos. This has been, it's been fun to see the other lectures and see how this is all coming together. Uh, I guess, you know, the, <laughs> as Jeff mentioned, this, the lecture you're going to watch is a little longer, but man, does it have a lot of pieces together. Um, this has been a lot of fun to kind of think about what to communicate to you all about this topic. Um, that's so dear to my heart, the Gulf of California. And so when Jeff and I were um, speaking about like, okay, what, what could we focus on? And, and that the, it really clicked to me that the proceeds of, um, of the lecture series are going to support the Konkak or the Seri people um, in their uh, remarkable fight against COVID and remarkably successful. And, and so much of my work with in the Gulf of California has been directly in collaboration and learning um, from the Konkak. And I was like, well, let's connect you to them as much as possible. So um, so really, I'll, I'm going to be giving like a brief little intro that just kind of helps set the stage of the Gulf of California at large and then zooming in. But then you'll hear from um, two Konkak ecologists, uh, Myra Estoran and Leona Hoffer, who are good friends that I've had the pleasure to work with. And so really, you'll be able to hear from their perspective um, the work they're doing. And, and then we're maybe excited to talk to you in the question and answer piece. But if that wasn't enough, then we're also doing the, to kick it off is the cooking class, which I get to do with my dad. And man, what's better than that? So this whole thing has been so much fun um, in addition to the, all of you supporting such an important cause. And, and Jeff and um, Carlos, thank you guys for making it possible. I think I won't go on from there. Let's get to the content. Great, thank you so much, uh, Ben. As, as you all can see, we get uh, Wilder Squared today. <laughs> uh, we're so lucky. Um, so uh, you can go ahead now and um, press play on, on the video. And uh, again, just to remind you, we'll be uh, right back here at 1.45. Thanks again. Right. Enjoy, see you back here. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, hope you enjoyed that fabulous presentation. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, so yeah. I. Well, we have some time for a little uh, question and answer, answer here, um, and I will uh, moderate the questions and read them to Ben, because it's very difficult to actually uh, stay present enough to answer questions and be looking at the chat box. So thank you. Uh, please, uh, please um, write in if you have questions for us, and we'll uh, I'll make sure that I uh, get those relayed to Ben. I guess I would just say that was a lot of fun. That was the mixing all these pieces together. I was and I, I took the time to watch the whole thing together. So I just want to say a big shout out to Carlos for putting that all together and Jeff for doing this series. Thanks a lot. Oh, thank you, Ben. It was really, uh, beautiful, beautiful slides, beautiful presentation. What an incredible place. Indeed. Um, let's see, we got a our first question here. Um, what is the name of the fruit that tastes like strawberry and watermelon and where can we get it? <laughs> yes, unfortunately, well, you're gonna have to do some traveling to get it. So that is the, um, the Stenocereus gamosus or the, in Spanish, the name of Pitaya agria and the Concac referred to it as shishkap. Um, so that is a, a species that's actually um, truly endemic to the Sonoran Desert, meaning only found within the boundaries of the Sonoran Desert and quite um, narrowly at that. 
So it's, a, it's a, I mean, I could talk the rest of the time about just that species. It, it ranges throughout the entire Baja California Peninsula through that whole climatic gradient I described. So it incur, includes uh, the Southern Cape region that where you get um, kind of just summer rain all the way up to just on the edges of Ensenada where you get fog influence and, and purely winter rain. And then it occurs on the Midriff Islands either on the Bajadas of Tiburon and then just on the mainland in the Seri region. Uh, really fascinating distribution. Quite possibly uh, it occurs in the Seri region because it's so dang delicious and people brought it there from the peninsula. We're actually studying the, geno the genome and the genomics, uh, population genomics of that species in a new project we have um, dealing with collaborators at ASU and elsewhere. Uh, I have to say the you only really get the those delicious, delicious fruits after really good rain years, such as tropical storms. Um, so like in September or so. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We've got a question from Bonnie. Um, are the COVID patients treated with the herbal medicines together with traditional or just the herbal? Um, as far as I know, the the so the, it's almost everything. That Myra was, just, was describing to us are taking the form of teas. And then there's, um, I was also in conversations with Lori Monti, who um, with Gary has been facilitating a lot of the relief work uh, and supplies coming down from the US um, through the Borderlands um, network, uh, the fundraising. Gary, and so, so Lori and Gary have spent a lot of time there, down there. And Lori was also saying how important um, going in the ocean has been and just cleansing. Uh, with salt water and just um, spending time in the ocean. And, and, and then I'm sure that there's other um, approaches that people are taking and, and I can't speak to that. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot of smudging that's happening with some of the more um, uh, plant species that have a lot of these uh, kind of incredible uh, phytochemical properties such as bursera and, um, and there may be some of that, but I, I, I don't know too in detail beyond. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see, we have um, a question from Herb, uh, Burton um, who asks, did Baja and other parts of the Sonoran Desert have the same, suffer from the same drought that we had uh, here in Tucson? Great question. I've been trying to find that out, the answer to that question myself. Um, the answer is largely yes. So we, the other major form of moisture that comes during the summer um, months are tropical storms. And and we rarely get them and they're much more, they kind of gradually more frequent as you get south. There were a couple of hurricanes that happened, but they just kind of barely kissed the southern part of the peninsula. And so, I mean, it's actually very interesting. If those of you are familiar with the most southern part of the peninsula, which is the Cape region, kind of this insular piece, La Paz sits on the northeast part of that. They received almost no rain in La Paz. But down in um, Todos Santos, Los Cabos, and Cabo Pulmo, in that area, the kind of central in the Sierra La Laguna, central southern part of the Cape did. Like I saw, saw pictures and I was like, wait, like it's brilliant green there, but not in La Paz. It's kind of crazy. Um, I can't even remember the last time that happened. And then various pieces up. So for where we're talking about in the Midriff region, very, very dry. I don't know if anyone's seen pictures from the San Carlos Guaymas region. It looks like it's June or something. It is crazy. Very, very dry throughout. So no, it was a pretty much a, a region-wide um, failure of the monsoons. Alamos from the continent side did get some decent rains, but I've been talking to friends there and um, and Jeff, I'm curious if you've heard this too, but it sounds like there's people didn't even plant that, uh, that the rains came in bad timing. And so while it may be green from my eyes at seeing pictures, the timing of the rain was way off. So a, a pretty significant uh, abnormality of rainfall across the, the region as a whole. Well, no, I haven't heard anything from Aldos, but it seems about right for this crazy year we've had so far. In <laughs> um, let's see, we have another question here from uh, Jody Lee. Um, let's see, would you please give us the common US names and scientific name of the five plants in the COVID bags? I got Senna and Creosote. Okay. There, this is a good quiz. All right, you're quizzing me on my own talk. I like it. All right, I'm not gonna um, succeed here because there's actually one species that I've been trying to track down and I'm not sure of. So, um, Bursera laxiflora, 
which doesn't really have an English common name as I know it uh, because it doesn't occur up here. And that's the Hope Gauk. Um, uh, you can call it like, um, it's, it's got a very beautiful tri, uh, um, kind of a trifoliate leaf um, with a wing gracus. Anyway, uh, kind of botany terms. And then the um, Ebenopsis confinus, uh, God, this is like, I really dislike common names because the common name from that species is the dog poop bush because the, the pods look like dog poop. So ignore that name. Um, and then you have the Laria or creosote bush, um, the Senna or desert Senna that we have here, Senna covesiae. Uh, is the name uh, means the plant that um, sings like bells, like rings, because if this is also kind of known as rattlesnake bush. So sometimes you brush it and it sounds like a rattlesnake um, rattle, that, that's that plant. And then the other one is the uh, Eiapot Guamso, which I'm trying to track down what that is. I think it's a, it's a comp in the sunflower family. It doesn't occur on tuberone. I was just looking at my own book here um, and trying to track that. I knew someone was gonna ask that question. And I, I don't, I'm still trying to find out what, what species that is. Great, great question. We've got another one here that's uh, a really another good, uh, great one. It's about kind of um, ecological relationships. So Kiki is asking, uh, personal observation that the numbers of marine organisms seem to be decreasing um, in, in parentheses, is this true? Um, and then uh, what are the increasing number of turtles eating? Oh, what an increasing number of turtles eating. Great. So Good question, Kiki. The yeah, there's no question that in the Gulf of California we're seeing um, a significant loss, certainly in uh, abundance of species. And at this point, it's not we're not seeing the ripple effect to at the diversity in terms of number of species quite yet. Well, that's not entirely true actually, because just think about sharks alone. We're seeing so many fewer shark species too. And this is all due to overfishing <clears throat> and especially shrimp trawling. So we didn't talk about it with my dad, but one of the other main uh, biggest culprits for the loss of abundance and diversity of the marine realm is these giant trawling that happens. So you get shrimp in the Gulf by primarily by these big commercial fleets that go out with these trawlers and a trawler is a, gi a giant net underwater that's weighted on the bottom and it scrapes the ground. And so there's just literally this huge net that goes through the water column and captures everything in its path and it brings it up on deck. I mean, these cranes pull it up and drop it on deck and, and there's just this writhing mass of, of life of everything encounters. And people go through literally and pick out the shrimp and then everything else, 90 plus percent of the species of the, what's caught is bycatch. That's the official name, it's bycatch. And it is, is, is discarded as waste and all that life is lost for those little pieces of shrimp that are caught. So, <clears throat> so we're seeing horrific loss in the diversity and abundance throughout the Gulf. Uh, but what's just, this, I'll give a long-winded answer here because we're seeing though in marine protected areas throughout the Gulf, including Isla San Pedro Martir, Cabo Pulmo down in the Southern part of the, of the Gulf, um, islands off of Loreto and um, in the Canal de Infernillo, that when these spaces are given time without fishing, the re, the, the, how they are able to rebound is extraordinary. And that within just years, uh, you start seeing the, 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 both the diversity and the abundance come back. So, I mean, the resilience within the system is very strong. The turtles, um, well, Myra gave, I, I learned a lot from what she shared with us that the olive ridley or the golfinas, um, I'm gonna close the door. are not uh, feeding in the area, they're feeding elsewhere, but the green turtles are in the, in the one of the principal um, food sources are, is um, Zostra marina or eelgrass or AS in, in, the, in Quinquitum. And that's, um, you know, uh, that, that kind of very widely spread uh, species kind of throughout much of many of the world's oceans, but it occurs close to its southern extent in the Gulf, of, in the Sari region, and also um, is an annual there, which is unlike its what its presence elsewhere because of such hot temperatures the water gets in the summer. Um, 
Richard uh, Felger and Mary Beck Bozer did a lot of wonderful studies about how important the eelgrass is. And the primary eelgrass beds in the Gulf of California are in the Canal de Invernio, but also Bahia Concepcion in the peninsula. Um, and they're critical for the sea turtle, especially the green sea turtle species. I'll just mention one other thing that was interesting that Myra shared about this kind of, this is an interesting place where uh, Western science and traditional knowledge creates a lot of fascinating um, points for inquiry in terms of the number of species that are recognized. I was like, I was asking Myra how many species they recognize. She said six, and but in there's about 14 plus names for that the Goncock recognized for sea turtles. And, and she gave that great description of that there's different stages they're recognizing and different varieties. And so species, not species, I mean, it depends on your definition of a species perhaps. Um, and so there's different answers for the same question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, on the topic of sea turtles, I think that um, sea turtle conservation is one of the great success stories in Mexico, really. And, yeah. you know, the connection between um, indigenous communities and that success um, is very tight. Absolutely. And, and, and you see that model um, replicated in a really powerful way uh, on coast throughout the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see, we've got a question from uh, Natasha here who asks, um, do you know which crops are being planted in those community gardens uh, slash greenhouse in Desemboque? No, that's a great question. So um, Gary just went down there about a week and a half ago and he kind of called me and said, I've got 250 packets of seeds and we're going and planting under this photovoltaic the, the solar cells. And I, he didn't quite give me time to ask him what species were. Um, so no, I don't know. We'll have to get a report back and get some pictures and to see what they're doing. Yeah, have to do a follow up here. That'd be great. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, anyone else um, like to pose a question for Ben? Those are great. Got some more time here. Um, I have a question for you, Ben, if I may. Please. Um, so, uh, the, I know this is a very complicated question, so <laughs> you can dodge it <laughs> if it is too, too much, uh, too complicated. Yeah. I'm always curious about how, um, boundaries are, uh, geographic boundaries are established around ecosystems, you know, which is, I mean, obviously a co-creation between, um, you know, ecology, you know, nature and humans. And I just wonder about this, the southern boundary of the Sonoran Desert. So it looks to me like it's around, uh, just an in and around Guaymas, is that right? Mm -hmm. well, and how do researchers determine that? Oh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> or maybe a better way to ask that is what signals that for you as you're looking at the landscape? Yeah, well, okay, there's, a, there's some interesting history here. Um, so, it, okay, so, the Sonoran Desert, as we largely view it, is defined based on plants and vegetation um, in terms of plants being this uh, metric of how they're responding to the climate in terms of the growth forms or the physi physiognomy, um, literally what their morphological features are they're responding to these different climatic influences. And uh, so that was really how Shreve kind of took together a lot of different approaches of how you define the boundaries and, and presented his a unified theory. When he established <clears throat> his definition in subregions of the Sonoran Desert, that uh, in 1951, that included this um, kind of essentially short tree forest or foothills uh, subdivision of the Sonoran Desert, which is exactly where you're talking about. We're in kind of the southern, south of Hermosillo as you gray down into um, the Sierra Libertad, into San Carlos, Guaymas um, region, and, and then down to Obregón even. Mm -hmm. And that is marginally a desert in the sense that it, you're getting a lot more rain than 12 inches a year. And the height of that vegetation structure is relatively tall. You're getting the sh short tree or short thorn forest. So there's a gradient here on the southern edge of the desert as you go into the tropics and you get more moisture. And essentially you just see the stature of the, of the plant species of vegetation go up and the density increase and the species composition become a lot more tropical. And what I mean by that is species that have their ranges uh, limited on the north is really primarily to the south. And that then you have this kind of 
thorn scrub, which is composed of a lot of species that you have in the desert, but are also and more widely spread in the tropics, then into this kind of short tree forest and then in tropical deciduous forests, which you find around Alamos. And there's just, it's honestly just a broad gradient. There's no clear like lines. And so <clears throat> the, the height of the tree and the canopy when is the rule of thumb that um, David Yetman, Alberto Burquez and Richard Felger and all of our dear friends have established is that when the trees start to get taller than the columnar cacti, then you're kind of out of the desert. Oh, I've never heard that. That's great. That starts to happen around Wymas and whatnot in Alberta. I will never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, another question here. Um, let's see, Jody Lee writes, um, I haven't been there in 40 years, uh, but I stayed in Desemboque several times studying the plants with Angelita Torres. Mm. Um, I remember her. Um, the area used to support trade in ironwood carvings and beautiful thin pottery. Are there still healthy ironwood trees nearby and clay sources? Yeah, so the clay, I I'm only aware of the pottery is kind of a more historic piece. I've, since I've been working in the region, I haven't seen active pottery work being done. And unfortunately, the right around the time period you're talking about, Jody Lee, there was a boom in the ironwood carving um, industry. That way, I mean, it, this wasn't an industry when the Concac were doing it. This was an artisanal product uh, they were creating. And there, I don't know, I'm sure many of you on the call probably have some ironwood figurines in your house, but uh, they're these kind of just beautiful sculptures made of that incredibly dense wood. And, and they, they, it caught a market, I mean, then just took off. And so you started seeing these replicate or knockoff carvings of ironwood trees happening throughout Sonora and then in Baja California. And some of this was done, people came and trained and learned from the Concac and others just straight ripped them off, was the majority of it, honestly. And so you just had decimation of these ironwood uh, gallery forests or forests all over the region. And uh, man, just, if you ever get the chance when you're, if you're driving from Adamasio to Kino and you're getting close to, um, Kino, you can just stop the car and get out and walk through an old forest. You'll just see these massive trunks of ironwood. They're just cut, all of them just chainsawed. And the populations haven't recovered very well because they're so, so slow growing. So you don't see much ironwood carving anywhere, but they've transitioned, the Concaca have transitioned to using um, some soapstone, uh, it's kind of our terms, these beautiful kind of colored boulders that occur just outside of Punta Chueca. And are doing carving with the, with rocks now primarily in some ironwood, but very little. It, it's not a um, a sustainable uh, pro um, venture anymore because of um, essentially how much of the the trees have been lost. Mm -hmm. Basketry yeah. is being sorry, Jeff. I was just going to add that instead of pottery, it's a lot of it is being done with um, baskets, hand woven baskets made for, especially from the limber bush, Detrofa or at. Uh, which are, yeah, just stunning, um, really beautiful basket work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking too, it must be such a different medium to work with rock I know. versus wood, even though ironwood is so dense and hard. But. And, it's, and some of the same people um, made that transition, yeah. Good to know that. <clears throat> uh, we have one more here too. Um, Connie is asking, uh, I'm not clear on the relationship um, between Prescott College and the Concac community. Um, do you know anything about it? Yeah, good question. So uh, Prescott College, as we know, is a liberal arts um, university up in Prescott, Arizona. But they have the field station down in Keno Bay that's over 30, 35 years or more. And they, um, speaking of Gary, actually, he was in the first class that Prescott ever had down in, in Keno. And the, it's, uh, a wonderful center that's just kind of this hub of um, inquiry and research and cultural exchange, both with the uh, Mexican community in Bahia de Quino through some incredible environmental education programs they have, and then also uh, with the CONCAC. And so there has been an indigenous um, studies program that they've run for many years that Lori Monti was uh, worked with, uh, who's a Southwest fellow as well now, um, and it's, I think the whole program's goals all along were to have someone like Lionel in that position um, of working that 
br bridging the station with the communities um, in Punta Truck and Disemboque. So they, uh, the programs themselves, as Leonel was describing, do a lot of uh, intermixing of the Prescott students or other visiting courses. So there's field classes that um, visit from all over the country, including Javier Basurto, who got his um, master's here at the U of A uh, on working with the Concac and their Cayo de Acha fishery. Uh, he now does a field course every year from Duke that he brings and bases out of the station. And, um, and they also, the Prescott College Station has the best boating program of any station in the Gulf of California um, with Cosme Becerra who runs that and is just the best panguero hands down anywhere. And so the, the station, um, yeah, serves a lot of really important roles. Great. Yeah, I think that the, it, the, the Seri um, people and the, you know, Seri, the Concoc territory have this such a long standing relationship with people coming from, uh, from the US. Yeah. Not, you know, as you say, not just on the commercial ironwood level, but, you know, thick relationships around research and mm -hmm. all kinds of things that have been happening for a pretty long time there. It's, it's really impressive. No, I mean, in, in the, the Southwest Center, you guys have published some of the seminal works that really exemplify that. I mean, I always think about the Sarah Hands uh, special issue of the journal and that, that captures exactly what you're talking about. And one of the things that I, I've been so fortunate myself to, to be a part of that community. And one of the things that hit me early on when starting doing my work was that there was this shared object of passion. You know, so I show up and you know, all barriers aside, right? That I'm asking questions about plants and what plants occur here, what plants are on the island. And Umberto comes at that with the same passion and this, this deep interest, uh, generational, passed on from his mother uh, about the plants as well. And so here's this guy shows up, doesn't partly speak Spanish, certainly doesn't speak in Quinquitum. And I was like, what, 18 at the time? And asking about plants, and it was like boom! Within minutes, we had formed this connection, and and I think that permeates among so many different collaborations that have established, and just this shared mutual interest, and 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 create and curiosity and and insights that and that just form really wonderful and lasting partnerships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. It's just uh, one of those. One of those things that makes me so grateful that I live in Tucson, you know, another one of those incredible, um, I don't know, those kinds of cultural dynamics that, that somehow we have in this city that's, that are just, you know, really, that really uh, uh, fortify, <laughs> I think, life in this region, you know. Absolutely, no. Uh, you know, I don't see any more questions. It might be, that might be a nice place to, to stop unless we have somebody who wants to do a Hail Mary uh, over the finish line. Question bomb. <laughs> I think this was great. I mean, we could, as you know, we could talk about these topics forever, but um, thank you. I really, really appreciate having this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Ben. It really has been a pleasure. Really appreciate it. And thank you, Carlos. And thanks everyone for joining us today. And we'll see you next time. All right. Saludos. Saludos.